sort of the due process uh, mentioned on Constitution. Fifth Amendment The due process basically uh, is a requirement that when you know, whenever there's legal matters, uh, it must be resolved according to established the rules, procedures, and the principles that individuals must be treated fairly. So uh, let's uh, take a look at the uh, my PowerPoint and start here. All right, so when we talk about due process, uh, really it, it refers to whenever uh, government trying to punish somebody for violating a law uh, through denying a person's life, liberty, or property, and that person, um, well, specifically uh, the accused person, must be given proper notice and offer him the opportunity to be heard and a decision uh, made by a neutral decision makers, either being a judge or a jury. So due process nowadays uh, include at least two uh, elements. One is the procedural due process, and it is contained mostly in the fourth through eighth and amendment in the Constitution. And then there's a, a second component that is the substantive, uh, substantive due process. And so it guarantees individuals a certain rights unrelated to the procedures. Okay. So um, a lot of time when we read the uh, Bill of Rights, uh, we hear a lot of uh, terminologies. And some of them are uh, in the Bill of Rights and others uh, in containing other part of the Constitution, such as term habeas court, Ex post uh, facto law, bill of tender, double jeopardy, probable cause, self incrimination, right to counsel, speed in the public trials, cross examination witnesses, an impartial jury, cruel and unusual punishment. So we'll Look at them uh, when we uh, look at the each of the uh, uh, amendments uh, the discussion below. We already talked about other uh, Latin terms like uh, habeas corpus, uh, meaning that uh, the suspect must be brought before the judge to be informed about you know what the person was accused of. This tradition called the habeas corpus. Ex post facto law, uh, meaning that uh, Congress uh, passed a new law and the law could only be used uh, for future actions. It can now apply the law to punish somebody who did it, a particular act before the enactment of this new law. So you can apply uh, the cases in future scenarios, not going backwards. And be of a tender uh, is mentioned in the Constitution, meaning the uh, Congress is not allowed to uh, pass a bill trying to make somebody guilty without a due process. Uh, so you got to give a file a fair trial rather than just pass a law, make somebody guilty. And then you find the rest of terminologies there, and uh, we'll mention them uh, below. So the Fourth Amendment uh, and all the way through the Eighth Amendment in the Bill of Rights really prescribe all those uh, procedural requirements for the uh, conducting a civil or criminal trials in the United States. So uh, those amendments provide some of the most important procedural rights, procedural rights. The violation of uh, those procedural rights can lead to 
uh, you know, uh, the cases uh, in rather court. So let's start with force amendment. So force amendment start with the initial encounter between the citizen and the law enforcement, such as the police. So if the police stop you and they believe you're a suspect, you committed something, can they conduct a search? And where can they search you? And what can be searched? And so the Fourth Amendment uh, was uh, written you know, 240 years ago. You can see that's very specific. And the mention about the uh, search subject uh, scope, including their persons, their bodies, their houses, which is their residence, the paper, meaning their documents, the oaths, and effects, something, anything they produce. And the search must be reasonable. So you have to have a reason to conduct that search and seizure. And the reason is mostly based on the probable cause. So probable cause is a articulable suspicion, suspicion about something that is hidden uh, by the suspect, uh, either on his body or in his possessions, uh, in his residence. So you have a probable cause, then you need to go to the court uh, to obtain a search warrant from a judge. So the police chief does not sign the search warrant and it has to be signed by a court judge. So judge is a third party and the he or she will be the, the guardian of uh, the individual rights. Uh, so if there's no probable cause, and then there should be no search warrants. And so Fourth Amendment also talk about, you know, uh, what makes the search warrants a valid uh, a document. So all search warrants must contain a description of the place to be searched and who is to be searched and what are supposed to be found. More specifically, you're going to see like the time, uh, the, the search should be conducted. The so violation of any of those terms can render those uh, search results uh, invalid. Valid. And the Fifth Amendment uh, get into a little bit deeper. So when a person already been, uh, you know, held by the police officer and the trial is about to start, and so they have a number of uh, procedural rights. So uh, cannot be tried for any serious crime without a grand jury uh, to reach the verdict. Um, there has to be enough evidence against you, and and they uh, there should be uh, no uh, use of uh, double jeopardy, so you cannot be tried uh, for the same offense twice. Twice. So if the jury finds you not guilty, uh, and then that's it. And you cannot be tried again if later there's a new piece of evidence to surfaced because you've already been declared innocent uh, in the trial. Okay. And then uh, the Fifth Amendment also against a suspect uh, to uh, to be witnesses against himself. In other words, uh, the Fifth Amendment is against the use of uh, self-incrimination. I often we hear people uh, mention that I'll take my fifths. That means they rather keep silent not to testify against him or herself, not to volunteer any evidences, and not to confess about his crimes. And the burden of proof uh, to make somebody guilty is on the police, on the public prosecutors, not on the defendant. So if the government want to, uh, you know, prison somebody, they must come up with the credible, credible evidence 
and to prove that person uh, is uh, guilty. And the uh, suspect or the defendant don't have to do anything. Uh, he or she choose uh, to help the police uh, to prove that he or her was uh, guilty. So uh, forced uh, confession uh, will not be able to be used. Uh, you cannot uh, conduct the torture for somebody to confess. So um, the exception will be a voluntary confession. If somebody uh, really uh, feel guilty about himself, and uh, yeah, he can, uh, you know, help the police, and by uh, confessing to the crime, that makes things uh, simpler. But again, uh, uh, this is all voluntary. You don't have to do it. But if you uh, probably have voluntary confession, maybe. Uh, that could be a part of the uh, plea bargain, and the police might, uh, you know, promise you if you, um, you know, acknowledge or volunteer some information, acknowledge your guilt, uh, maybe they will exchange for light sentences. Uh, so we do see uh, people uh, voluntarily uh, confess a crime or uh, to use that the confession as evidence to. Uh, you know, to make the uh, case uh, resolved. Uh, but any, you know, involuntary confession should not be used for all. So if somebody refuses to talk, and that's it, all his right remains silent. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, the Fifth Amendment also talks about the due process of the law here. I talk a person cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without a due process. And now shall private property be taken for public use without just compen compensation. But this is uh, going to come up another terminology here. It's called the uh, imminent domain. Imminent domain. So sometimes the public want to uh, government to build a highway, and the highway might pass through your houses, your properties. In that case, uh, then they will, uh, you know, uh, ask you to uh, sell the property at the market price. Uh, the individual um, really cannot refuse that. Uh, if they come to that point, and if you refuse or if your demand is too high for your property uh, values, and then the, you know, the government can uh, pass a uh, special order just called imminent domain to condemn you for refusing to sell your houses. But despite that, you know, uh, even you have to uh, sell your houses property to the government for public project, then they have to pay you a fair price. That's called just compensation. Just compensation. All right, so there's a lot of stuff in, in the Bill of Rights. Uh, so they all, you know, anticipated uh, 40 years ago. Now the Sixth Amendment uh, dealing with the trial process. So you're already in deep trouble. You know, you're about to face trial. Uh, so the Sixth Amendment talk about you have a right to a speedy and a public trial. You have a right to speedy and a public trial, meaning that you know, has to be reasonably uh, scheduled. It cannot be, po uh, you know, postponed indefinitely. Where well, you are in custody, stay in the prison cells, and should be uh, public trials unless uh, it is for national secrecy. So a lot of uh, espionage, uh, all cases dealing with uh, national security. Uh, yeah, it, it can be held. Uh, in secret, in private, and not a public trial. So uh, there's some exception to that. And so we also have a jury system. You know, again, uh, we are used to that, but not, not all, every country is uh, used to jury trials. The jury system is unique uh, to Great Britain, to the United States. Uh, it asks a group of uh, selected uh, eight persons uh, to be the citizen judge, and they will be present with uh, evidences. 
and then make their uh, decisions whether or not the suspect the guilty criminal cases or liable in the civil cases. Uh, but the requirement for any jurors that is they have to be impartial. They, they cannot be biased. And uh, so that's why you know, uh, you, whenever you're being calling for a jury duty, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, the lawyers on both sides uh, trying to uh, select the uh, people from a jury pool to uh, ensure they are not biased against their clients. Uh, so there's a process, you know, what is impartial juries. And then the Sixth Amendment uh, also talk about the, uh, the person, uh, you know, have a right to be confronted and to be cross-examined by uh, witnesses, <coughs> even the suspect, <coughs> and then all have a right to examine witnesses. And uh, finally, the uh, Washington Amendment talks about person have a right assistance of a counsel. I mean, everybody have a right, especially the defendant. I used to be um, you know, based on the witnesses, and sometimes people not afford lawyers. That issue has been uh, resolved. Okay, so the uh, now become the court patients to provide a public attorneys in case the uh, defendant uh, could not afford attorney, the right attorney. Uh, is uh, actually guaranteed whether you are rich or poor. Said that I guess the uh, quality of the attorney can be questionable. Rich, they can hire a whole bunch of uh, well qualified attorneys to defend on your side. If you do have a lot of financial resources, uh, you know, sometimes the chances that you you I wonder. Either. Attorneys are good, but again, you don't have to uh, use their right. Uh, you are capable of uh, defending yourself uh, if you can uh, give up their right and to defend yourself. The, uh, this is not absolutely necessary, but again, it'd be fully foolish not to have a lawyer. Especially dealing with uh, criminal cases. The Seventh Amendment uh, really uh, talk about the some cases. Uh, the civil cases, a trial by jury, should also be guaranteed. But there has to be some kind of a dollar amount. You can't just have a jury trial if you're still. The neighbor's uh, dog uh, bites somebody or uh, broken the glasses. So there has to be a significant amount of uh, you know, compensation demanded. But the Constitution is sort of a $20. I think nowadays, bar is a lot higher than that. And finally, the Eighth Amendment, I talk about the punishing phase. So in civil cases, uh, it prohibited the, the use of excessive bails and fines. So it cannot make the people pay more than what is fair, what is reasonable in terms of bail or fines. And in uh, criminal cases, uh, government cannot inflict cruel and unusual punish, punishment. So again, those are very apt terms. So how much is excessive? How, what? Act what punishment is considered as uh, cruel and unusual. Uh, so you know we used to cut somebody's heads off. Uh, we you know have a death squad and shooting somebody from the back, and those are generally speaking are considered cruel nowadays. So we have uh, invented the lethal injections uh, that probably make the death penalty less cruel. 
But then you have people talking about even uh, the use of disparity itself can be a cruel punishment. As a matter of fact, uh, most uh, Western uh, democracies have already abolished death penalties. Our Europe and our neighbors like the Mexico and Canada all abolished the death penalties. The United States is really the few Western nations that still carry out death penalties, either at the federal level or at the state level. So that could be a debate for another topic, like uh, whether or not uh, we should uh, uh, continue to use death penalty and whether or not the uh, death penalty uh, by nature a cruel and unusual punishment. All right, so that's a, a summary of uh, all the uh, procedural uh, rights that are guaranteed in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Amendment. So let's just focus on a couple of few uh, you know, points uh, in some of the amendments. Let's start from the 4th Amendment. The 4th Amendment uh, talk about the search and the seizures. And so we citizens uh, quite often will encounter some kind of a police actions so one way or another. So often uh, in interactions is the traffic stop. So if you are, are stopped by a police on the uh, public road, and can police just randomly assert you and open up the, the back trunk of the car and uh, you know, so are there any limits? Do they need a search warrant? So there are uh, some general rules uh, has been stipulated by the courts over the years. Uh, so there are uh, some different requirements. If, uh, you know, you're subject to search uh, in the house, just speaking, the government need to show a search warrant is searching a private residence. And but when you search a uh, automobile on a highway and for minor violations, and the police uh, don't need don't need a search warrant. There's no time for that. And police, well, there's some restrictions. Uh, police can uh, search your body if they suspect something uh, was illegal. You know, could be causing a um, threat to their to the police. Uh, you know, like guns or weapons. They, they can, you know, do the frisky and uh, frisk and pet bodies. Now, things inside your car, inside your vehicle, uh, the police can search anything that are that are viewable through the public space. They, you know, can see it from outside your car, anything like opened uh, ears or weapons and bullet shells laying in the uh, back seat, that will be sufficient uh, for the police to conduct a, a little more search inside your cars. So for instance, if you, they find a, 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 a bullet shell lying in your back seat, and the police might ask, maybe uh, a crime has been committed, bullet was fired, a gun was used. So they have a probable cause to search your, cl your clothes uh, compartment and your back trunk to make sure uh, that there's, there's a gun, there's no guns. But normally speaking, if there's no visible evidences from outside your car and the police probably shouldn't open up your glock compartment, you know, your closed back trunk. Okay, again, it's up to the police to tell the court what are the proper costs leading him or her to do the, uh, you know, more detailed search uh, in your closed uh, areas. In your car. Okay. Now uh, go back to the search. Uh, in modern days, uh, the search is no longer just simple 
body petting and frisk. Uh, search is a legal term nowadays, and a lot of things uh, can be searched. They are subject to the Fourth Amendment protections. Number one is a private home, private residence, and that was always, uh, you know, required to have a search warrant unless there is some exigent urgent situation. Like police can see from the outside on the street somebody waving a knife and trying to kill somebody. Of course, the police can break in and um, Stop at and then conducting further searches without the search warrant. Or in some recent cases, uh, the police flying a helicopter over somebody's uh, house and they spot someone uh, drove um, illegal drugs, uh, opiums, uh, inside their backyard. Uh, because they can view that from the public space. And there, there will be no need for a search warrant. They can just land it their helicopter and get inside your backyard and uh, you know arrest you as well. Okay, so the the general rule is that if they can see it in plain view, and they don't need a search warrant. If you cannot, uh, then it depends on the voluntary cooperation. So if they knock on the door saying, hey. I hear some noises inside, inside your house. Can I take a look at it? Um, now you have all the right to say no, because they don't have any search warrant, and you don't have to open your door to let police and to peek inside the house. Okay, but if you are, you know, give up your right to say, hey, uh, I'm not a criminal. Why should I worry about it? Uh, if you want to get in to look at my house inside, so be it. Uh, welcome in. Mm -hmm. That probably opened up a lot more troubles because you don't know what's illegal, what's not illegal. But once you invite me in, and then everything they can see will become a plan bills. Okay? And then, yeah, if something they, they find illegal, they can search you uh, on that ground because, uh, you know, you invited me in. Okay. Same thing about the automobile. If uh, they ask you, hey, do you mind I, uh, you know, search your car? Uh, you say, hey, no problem, go ahead. And then they can search anything because uh, they, they, you have, uh, they have your permissions. So you should insist on uh, not to uh, voluntarily give up your rights. Uh, you should insist on uh, you know, your privacy and not just, uh, you know, inviting more troubles. So by refusing a police search it does not make you dangerous or make you more suspicious. Because you have the constitutional rights uh, on uh, privacy of your property. You don't want anybody to search for it. Okay, if you give up the right and you voluntarily uh, give a permission to the police, and please don't use search warrant. Okay. Anything they find can be used against. So, uh, in addition to other factors mentioned in this slide, uh, we also see that nowadays with the technologies, citizens uh, can be searched in many other ways. Sometimes even without your uh, aware of it. For example, can please uh, tap your phone conversation. The cell phone uh, numbers is just a, a bunch of uh, digital frequencies in the air. So if the government turn into a certain frequencies, yeah, they can receive the phone conversation. Just because the government has this uh, capabilities, does that mean the government can randomly uh, just uh, listen to anybody's conversation, hope your people they will, uh, you know, catch some credible evidence somebody is planning or something. The court uh, has been uh, clear on that, and uh, so in the United States and for citizens of the United States, the government are not allowed to just randomly to carry out the phone tappings on citizens. Again, <laughs> here's the word, citizens. 
I guess the American government does not mind if our uh, Homeland Security uh, agencies, they uh, conducted random form surveillances of uh, other countries, uh, peoples, and leaders. Uh, they, they do that. They do that. Okay. They, they, they don't have to get some search warrant for that. That is part of the intelligence gathering. But domestically, uh, I think the court has ruled in many cases, uh, the government just cannot, cannot uh, search anybody without any probable cause. So if you believe somebody's connected with a crime and you want to hear their conversation and the, the, you know, the law enforcement officer has to go to a specialized court uh, to get a search warrant uh, from a judge. Okay, so that is consistent with our force minimum protections. Other less common searches include like a drug testing, blood testing, or fingerprinting. And those are all important part of the evidence. Uh, so uh, yes, you, you, you know, if you uh, suspect, government can ask you to uh, to you know, to subject a drug, te drug testing or blood testing to find out what you took and um, what kind of illegal substance you use, okay? And in the, you know, if you drive on the public road and uh, if you drink, when the police stop you, yeah, you, you can um, require, you'll be asked to take a breast test to, to see whether or not you have a higher concentration of alcohols in your blood. So that's, that's a formal body search, but because you're on the public road, uh, so you're driving under influence, yeah, the, the government do not need a search warrant for have a, a breath test. Fingerprinting, that's something, you know, everybody fingerprint is unique. Uh, so if the government wants to check you to holding a, some objects and to leave your fingerprints behind, that's a search, that's a search. Uh, so if this is conducted in a legal investigation, uh, yes, you have to be part of uh, the search warrant uh, the court issued to get that piece of evidence. Okay. Now we are, you know, browsing internet and conducting communications, so emails, social, uh, social uh, network, social uh, apps. Uh, so we see the issue of uh, can government just um, searching uh, your records of uh, the site you visited, the email content. Uh, is your email secure when you have a Google emails? Uh, should that be subject to random search? Uh, so you know, we, we don't know exactly to what extent uh, the government can use those evidences, but in general, they should follow the force amendment. And if you are not a suspect, if there's no probable cause, the government should not simply just uh, reading your emails and uh, checking your, um, you know, internet access records. Okay, well, hopefully that's what the government has been doing. Uh, Again, another uh, important thing is that uh, the Fourth Amendment search uh, is limited uh, to the government actions. So for private citizens, it's a little bit different. So if you look at this case, uh, Tookie's boyfriend can break into her apartment and, uh, you know, you can find some uh, evidence of uh, illegal uh, evidence, illegal drugs. And then he turned over the drugs to the police and leading to the rest of the Tuki. So why this evidence was used? And this search was clearly illegal, right? So illegally break into somebody's apartment and conducting a legal search. So uh, since the Fourth Amendment is only used to limit the action of the government, okay? And so it's not a government conducted search. The Turkey has all the right to file a counter suit against uh, her boyfriend for illegal trespassing, for 
burglary, you know, whatever the common charges that she can file. She has all the right to do that. But she cannot stop a individual private citizens for turning uh, a piece of credible evidence to the police. Okay, and police can use the evidence to obtained by private citizens uh, as evidence to address the two cases. Okay, so here's a, a very important distinctions. Uh, government contact the search and the private citizens search are two different things. Okay, so, so search warrants is needed for government actions Individuals, when you conduct a search illegally, and that's a criminal act, it can be fined, you know, be prosecuted for that. But it does not stop the police from using evidence that obtains through a illegal search. Uh, so there are several uh, key terms here I want to define a there. One is the called exclusionary rule, uh, which suggests that any evidence obtained search without proper cause uh, are inadmissible in the court. So if the police or government conduct the search uh, without proper cause or have an invalid search warrant or something wrong with the um, search procedures, and that can be considered as a violation of the procedural rights and uh, therefore led to the, uh, the application of this exclusionary rules. So every year there are probably 100, 100 cases were thrown out of the courtrooms, not because the evidence is not credible, it's simply because how the evidence was obtained in the first place. A good faith exception. You know, the, <clears throat> the police do, do have the uh, you know responsibility to protect the public, and sometimes uh, they they might uh, you know make some mistakes. So if uh, uh, you know a cop coming to your place to conduct a search, but somehow they uh, he believed the search date was, uh, you know, at uh, 1 p.m., but he showed up at 1, you know, 1 15 p.m. That probably not going to stop the court from accepting the evidence. It could be that delay uh, caused by the traffic jam. So this is commonly called the good faith exception, a good faith exception, because the court want to be a little bit flexible rather than to be too rigid on how to apply some of the evidences. All right, the, that's all about the Fourth Amendment uh, protections. The Fifth Amendment talk about the uh, arrest and uh, the trial procedures. Uh, so even people that, uh, you know, to be arrested, they, they are, still have a certain rights, and there has been a arrest warrant issued by the court uh, so you have to read the arrest, uh, arrest warrant, and the arrest warrant must be made with probable cause too, credible evidence. And when you conduct the interrogation or arrest, you must read the suspect Miranda rights. Okay? Miranda rights, or sometimes we call them Miranda warning, uh, is a procedure that was established after the case of a Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, so the Miranda was a suspect. And at that time, there's no procedure to read suspect the constitutional right, such as the right to remain silent. And so Miranda uh, confessed his crime. But later he rescinded. Uh, he said, uh, I don't know, I have a right to uh, remain silent. And, uh, you know, my confession uh, is uh, involuntary. I didn't do it, right? So he changed his mind. And somehow the, the court was convinced 
the Miranda, uh, you know, need to know that uh, he doesn't have to talk. He doesn't have to admit his self-incrimination. So for that ground, Lin was ready to set Miranda free. And even, you know, he was involved in a serious criminal act. Uh, so after this case, uh, the, uh, it becomes standard uh, procedures. When the police interrogate somebody, when they arrest somebody, they always uh, read the suspect, the Miranda warning, which include that you have right to remain silent, anything you say can be used against you in the court of law, you have right attorney, blah, 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 blah. So all those things sound like a very mechanical, uh, boring, but that satisfies a very important procedural requirement. So if you have been read your constitutional rights, and uh, yes, dummy enough, you continue to talk, uh, yes, those talk will be considered as voluntary confession, and it can be used in a court of law as evidence. Okay, so uh, if you know your rights, and if you can keep silent, and after you being read your rights, uh, you can choose to volunteer uh, volunteer that information or just uh, dumb enough and keep talking, and that you know can also become a voluntary uh, confession. Now, on the issue of right to remain silent, uh, so when the police ask you uh, your questions about your name, your place of residence. And generally speaking, we expect you to be uh, cooperative. And uh, those are the cost to do an interrogation. Uh, it's nothing to do with what you have done. Uh, therefore, you know, should one should, should uh, you know cooperate on that ground, and that you don't know, have to say, hey, I, I don't want to talk because uh, uh, you know, incriminating against you, you just want. To establish identities. Then the fifth, the sixth amendment uh, also talk about the trial process, the right to confront witnesses, the use of plea bargaining, speedy trial, trial by jurors. We already mentioned some of that. Uh, the plea bargaining is a practice that are used to quite often in our courtrooms. I think in most cases, eventually resolved through some kind of a plea bargain. Plea bargaining referring to the, uh, the you know, the suspect or defendant uh, agree to acknowledge the wrongdoings on small matters. In exchange for the prosecutor to drop more serious charges. Um, so that's like uh, basically a trade off. And so, you know, because the legal process is, can be a very long process, can cost a lot of money. Sometimes people, you know, they don't want to go through the process and they don't, they have no confidence. They might win any cases, uh, even though they are not guilty. But sometimes, you know, not to sustain the uh, painful process, they might just, uh, you know, confess some small uh, wrongdoings. Uh, they, oh, just buy some money, so, you know, maybe one month's imprisonment. In exchange for the government to drop some more serious charges might end up, uh, you know, put you in prison for one year. So that's uh, called the plea bargaining. Uh, so that that's where most cases uh, are resolved. In most cases actually never face the court trials. And people would just go through their attorneys and to negotiate the terms to, you know, to engage some plea bargaining negotiations and to hopefully and it will drop some more serious charges and have the case closed. All right, that's all the time we have for the due process protection. Hope you learned something interesting. And, uh, definitely you want to watch the video that I recommended.
which is the, the busted uh, citizen counter uh, with the police. How do you survive that? So that will really give you a lot of life lessons and to protect yourself in case you're in trouble with laws. All right, I'll end uh, my uh, screen sharing here. I hope you will uh, read the chapters more carefully and uh, learn more practical knowledge.